It's been likened to a marital tiff that has seen partners spending several nights in separate bedrooms. But after weeks of feuding and with even the Mayor of London admitting that an early breakup was only logical, are we witnessing something more serious for the UK's coalition government? Could divorce papers soon be landing on the doormats of Whitehall? We're two different parties. He doesn't agree with everything, all my opinions, and I don't agree with all of uh, his opinions. That's, that's coalition government. It's, it's tough also, of course, to be in government at, in difficult times. It's not always a, a walk in the park or, or in the Rose Garden. Hello and welcome back to Analysis Review, where in this programme we look at the state and future of Britain's ruling coalition. With me here to discuss this is Jonathan Ford, the FT's chief leader writer, and Kieran Stacey from our parliamentary team. Welcome. Jonathan, could I start with you? Just looking back, it's been a torrid couple of weeks which are capping some terrible months for the coalition. I mean, we've had recently rebellions over House of Lords reform, over Europe. Uh, there's even uh, stuff kicking off over wind farms. I and mean, is this really breaking point for the coalition? I don't think it is. I think um, the real reason is things may be bad, but the alternatives for both parties in the coalition don't look so much better. Um, you know, I cannot see, looking at the state of the polls, that either party has a particular appetite for basically being the one who pulls down the coalition and goes to the country. I think there are two things I, I think they need to do. One is they need to basically get away from this uh, thing where both sides appear to be spending a lot of time talking to their own constituencies about what they would like to do if they were not in coalition with the other, because I think that's very unhelpful. The other thing they need to do is basically to find a way through this constitutional mess, the House of Lords bill, and, and in my view what they should probably do is they should just take constitutional reform off the agenda for the time being and concentrate on the economy. Right, just to pick you up on the, and bring Kieran in on this, talking to their own constituency. I mean, you, you follow this very closely over in Westminster. Why are the backbenchers uh, now, particularly in the Tory party, so restless and so prepared to go against their leadership? Well, you're right, first of all, Fred, to say that this is in the Tory party. Actually, what we've seen on the other side of the coalition for the Lib Dems, they've been remarkably loyal and unified and, and much more uh, willing to back the coalition when asked to do so. Uh, however, on the Tory side, it's a much bigger party, it's, it's less easy to, to control. But the big problem was David Cameron came in, he had this youthful face, this fantastic vision, uh, let sunshine win the day, I'm going to win the next general election, and then he didn't. And the party has basically never forgiven him. He dragged the party, or tried to drag the party, into the centre ground. He thought copying Tony Blair was the way to win elections. He forced them off the territory that many of them want to be on, which is a kind of neo-Thatcherite, neo-liberal agenda. He took them away from there, went up to the Arctic, told them to embrace green policies, told them that they had to fight on the centre ground, and then he failed to win the election. And, and they haven't forgiven him for that. And do they believe, just to be clear, maybe both of you can answer, that, that the electorate will back what you call the neo thatcher uh, um, agenda? Many of them do. And they now, the problem is, they now have one or two people they can rally around as figureheads of that agenda. Uh, Liam Fox being the obvious one, who is now positioning himself as the leader of the... Former the defense minister. Former defense secretary. He had to, uh, to, to resign from his post. Uh, he is now gathering people around him who say that, you know, we need to, to go back to, to Thatcherite, uh, cut tax, cut spending even more heavily than we are doing so already. That's the way to, to win back the election. But you seem I, to I, I would take, I, I don't wholly agree with what, I mean, I agree, I agree totally. It's a fantastic piece of political analysis of what people think at Westminster. I think, though, that the, the issue with David Cameron is, is in some ways that almost a more metaphysical one, which is that he came, the, the, the programme that Kieran describes, which he came in with, was really a programme for winning elections rather than for governing. I think one of the questions people are asking about David Cameron is, you know, what is he really, what is, what does he really want to do in government? So how does he regain the initiative? I mean, there's talk of a reshuffle in the autumn. Uh, I mean, is, is that, Kieran, well, is I, that? I'm sorry. Is that likely to happen? Definitely, yeah. I mean, we're overdue a reshuffle now. We're, you know, over two years into And what this type of, uh, what do you expect, both of you, in terms of what type of texture would that have? I mean, is it going to be bringing in some more uh, stridently conservative voices? Or? He needs to give a sense in the reshaping of the government of what he, where he wants to take it. I mean, I think it needs to be more than just the removal of a couple of old broken individuals. But on the other hand, he doesn't want to get into the sort of light of the long knives territory 
where he kills half his <laughs> half his ministers, yeah, and people wonder why did you pick them in the first place? Can I just say, on this? What about? I mean, there has been some speculation, which may just be that sort of. Uh, the, the product of the very febrile minds you get at this time of year in the political cycle, that the Prime Minister may want to move his closest ally, George Osborne. Chancellor of the Exchequer has had very difficult few months. Is this just the idle speculation of the... the Personally, I find this completely unthinkable. I just cannot imagine how he, as you say, his closest ally, the person who is in charge of the economy and the economic agenda, which is the sole governing purpose of this coalition. To actually remove the person doing that job would just be such an own goal. It would completely undermine their entire message, which is, we are the people in charge of the economy. We're doing it competently. Let us get on with it. Right. Can I, if I just before we, does this prove in, to both of you that Britain can't do coalitions? I think, I don't think that's what I would conclude. I think though that on the continent, People or parties that go into coalitions on a routine basis tend to have a very clear transactional view of what they're getting into. I think if you go back to 2010 and the famous Rose Garden moment with all the sort of love in between Cameron and Clegg, that's turned out to be a bit of a false dawn. That's not how these things work. And I think really what they're doing now is trying to grope their way towards a more sensible basis for proceeding. Final word from you, Karen, on this? Uh, I think we will be able to do coalitions in the future. I think we'll have, have to. to. Yeah. It's, it's just the reality of politics. I expect there to be another coalition in 2015. Kieran Stacey, Jonathan Ford, thank you both very much. And thank you for watching. To catch up on this story and other topics covered by our analysis team, please go to ft.com forward slash analysis. Until the next time, goodbye.